And now I'm going to introduce an, another Andrew, <laughs> Professor Andrew Gundy, who come all the way from Glasgow today, and he has brought with him some of his colleagues as well. So um, I want to extend a warm welcome to our colleagues from Glasgow. Now, just now, um, Professor Andrew McIntosh has talked quite a bit about the genes and the brain. Um, but of course, there's also environmental factors and also about relationships, about our psychological and social factors as well. So that's why we have um, a second Andrew here today and to talk about the psychological elements of depression. Um, I know Andrew, you're a clinical psychologist and a lot of your lovely work is around recovery from mental illnesses. Um, as well as particularly have a focus on human relationships and things like that. So, it's testing our resilience today, I think. Let's see whether we sort of suddenly get panic. Um, so, um, I'm just wondering from your perspective, from a psychological perspective, what is your understanding of resilience? So one of the important qualifications for talking about resilience has been called Andrew. I think you'll all agree. <laughs> And as Andrew, Andrew 1, I'm Andrew 2, as Andrew 1 has already said, resilience is, uh, is about the ability to kind of bounce back and uh, bounce back from kind of life stresses or what's called to successfully, to successfully adapt to stressful life events. So that could be life events such as trauma or um, life transitions of being an adolescent and figuring out who you are or you know, loss or bereavement, things like that. And I guess, I suppose one of the things that uh, the absence of resilience is not the presence of being distressed. That's a really important thing because I think um, it's really important that we don't interpret the absence of feeling depressed or, or the presence of depression or the presence of anxiety as a sign of lacking resilience actually we found that a lot of our very resilient kids who we work with are very good at talking about how depressed they are, are very good at, at, at talking about how anxious they are. And one of the really important aspects of their resilience is living in a social context where they have families and, and friends who are a source of support, or they've had experiences that enable them to access and construct that support that they can usefully utilize. So I think one of the one of the interesting debates I think is whether is whether we see psychiatric illness as an absence of resilience or whether we think about resilience in a in a, in a more I suppose in a more relational way, in a in a way that's much more embedded to the person's social and relationship context. Just to be controversial. <laughs> Um, I know a lot of your work is about attachment. Can you explain a bit to us what it means by attachment and why is that important for resilience? So, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. So, I mean, a lot of my work sort of clinically and in research is I, I work with adults but also uh, adolescents who have been diagnosed with a serious mental health problem mm -hmm. such as psychosis or schizophrenia and one of the one of the interests that I have is around how can we promote recovery for those how can we promote recovery for those individuals and uh, one thing that we discovered sorry about this one thing that we discovered was that where they had a difficult relationship with their key worker their nurse their psychologist or their psychiatrist that seemed to predict a, a poorer outcome. That seemed to predict some more difficult outcomes. So when we looked at that, we got interested in attachment. And attachment is really about looking at the kind of relationships that a person has experienced in their lives and how, I suppose, as we're growing up, the relationships that we have with our parents, with aunts, with uncles, with friends, peers, other significant adults in our lives. These are important because these relationships become internalized, sort of internalized models of how 
the social world work, and they kind of help us find our way through stressful life events. So a good attachment or a secure attachment um, promotes um, a good understanding of emotions, it promotes a good understanding of how your mind works and how other people's minds work, it helps you attune to what you're thinking and what other people are thinking, and it helps you solve problems day to day. And we've been able to prove that. Well, we've been able to show that in our research where we can look at the quality of recovery in young people and we can, we can see how those skills and competences seem to lead to better recoveries and better outcomes. And a, a kind of key thing for us is to say, well, actually in those kids who are struggling in their relationships, how can we, how can we enhance their relationships and how can we enhance their social context? And that's one of the big challenges of recovery. So you talk about relationship with other people, but I know some of your work also touch on people's relationship with themselves as well. So you, I think some of your work touch on things like self-criticism and things like that. So is that a bad thing to be critical towards yourself, or is it actually quite good? So yeah, so this is an important part of depression, because what happens in depression is that we often get into this very self-critical relationship with, with ourselves. So um, we might kind of call ourselves names, we might kind of issue punitive criticisms to ourselves in a very harsh and, and a very nasty tone. And, and sometimes what we see is that those relationships that people have towards themselves can often mirror other important relationships in their lives, you know, where they've experienced criticism. So one of the things that we do is we teach um, skills around cultivating a different emotional tone in relation to stressful experiences. So we, we help people think about what it feels like to tune into yourself in a kind of warm way or a kind way or a forgiving way, how you might respond compassionately to stressful life events. And that might sound like um, I mean, that, that work takes a lot of courage because what it means is uh, helping you know, people tune into quite difficult experiences or quite difficult thoughts or quite difficult memories. So a lot of that work in, in, encourages uh, people to develop the kind of courage and resilience to, uh, to uh, um, I suppose, think about and respond differently to painful life experiences or, or, or painful thoughts. So let's bring us conveniently to um, your next slide. I, I know this is one of the projects that is um, ongoing at the moment, and you've got colleagues here with you on this project as well. So what you're talking about is about cultivating a kind of good relationship with yourself and good relationship with others. And how is this um, project, Empower, going to achieve that? Okay, so Empower, this is, a, this is our new project. Uh, it's funded by a uh, UK funding agency called the National Institute for Health Research, but also by an Australian agency called the National Health Medical Research Council. And I'm excited about this project because, uh, well, one of the reasons I got into psychology was uh, I used to be a volunteer. When I was an undergraduate student, I was a volunteer and I worked at the National Schizophrenia Fellowship and I met some really inspiring people there. And uh, one of the things that I learned about was how disempowering it was for people to experience relapse or go into hospital. What we're doing in Empower is we're using mobile phones, digital technology, to try and put control back into uh, people's lives by giving them control over their well-being, giving them control over monitoring their, their well-being and also being able to access um, uh, sort of self-management messages that uh, develop their autonomy, that develop their recovery, and uh, that's what we're going to be doing for the next um, couple of years, is building a, a new digital intervention. Okay, that's, that sounds great. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. Um, we round of applause for Andrew. Okay. <laughs>